This is the WeDo Tina 2, a small form factor printer that may seem limited on its spec sheets, but has thoroughly blown me away in testing. What's up everybody, JJ here, and when WeDo reached out to me to send me this printer, I looked it up on the spec sheet and I was thinking, this isn't much of a printer. There's so many things it's lacking here. So I said, sure, send it over. I'll review it. They didn't pay me for this review and I thoroughly tested it with all these benchmarks. And I've got to say, it's really blown away my expectations for what I thought these specs would be able to deliver. So first off, let's go over the specs of this printer because I think that could be a non-starter for some people. And it comes with this sticker on the front that has all its specs on it. But I, of course, peeled it off because I don't need a sticker to tell me what specs are of my printer. So they list WeBuilder as the slicing software. They also have great Cura profiles, so I would recommend using Cura over WeBuilder. You can find that download on their website. Wi-Fi, this is the upgraded edition that comes with Wi-Fi and also this mesh guard here which stops you from touching the hot nozzle. The Wi-Fi I don't think is a great update. The Wi-Fi allows you to do firmware updates from the printer, but you don't usually have to update your firmware very often. For the right person though, this Wi-Fi allows you to connect their app to this printer and then print pre-sliced objects. For me, I don't want to print what they decided to give me. I want to print my own files, so I would rather print my own files or find my own files online, slice those. But if this was more for demonstration purposes in a library, in a school type setting, I could see that being a nice feature. The eco-friendly filament, it means it uses PLA. Uh, one click filament in, that's pretty standard on most printers. Auto bed leveling is huge. I feel like this one should be the first one listed over here. It comes with an auto mesh bed leveling, which creates a perfectly flat an even first layer on your printer, and you don't have to mess with manual bed leveling. Anyone who's gotten started on a 3D printer knows manual bed leveling is a huge pain and is most of getting started on 3D printing. Magnetic sticker, that's another really great feature. The build plate is just a sticker that sticks on there. It allows you to pull it off and flex it. That allows the prints to pop off really easily. This, I replaced it with a blue painter's tape to see if that would work and it does work really well. So the big spec that matters a lot is build volume because you can't change build volume. You're kind of locked in with a certain printer. It's 100 by 105 by 100 millimeters in cubed. 100 millimeters is about four inches. So you're not gonna be printing huge objects in one piece. You can split up large objects into several small pieces and then glue them together. And you might be surprised at how much you can fit inside of a four inch cube. Other specs on here really aren't that important. Nozzle diameter, you can change the nozzle diameter. Nozzle speed, they list at 40 millimeters per second, but you can totally change that in the slicer. Product dimensions, I think is of note. It's 210 by 210 by 290 millimeters. So the entire printer would fit in the build volume of some other printers. So it's nice and small. It could sit on a shelf out of the way. It's not gonna take up a bunch of space. So I think this could fit into a lot of environments where a larger printer wouldn't fit. Another really important spec that could make this a deal breaker is that it can only print PLA. PLA is an amazing filament. It's easy to print with. There's so many amazing colors and varieties out there. You can even get into some exotic PLAs. And with my first 3D printer, it took me probably a year and a half before I ever tried anything besides PLA. I did try a flexible TPU on here. It just wasn't strong enough to push it through the nozzle. And once you've read these, you don't really need this sticker anymore. You can take it off. It makes it a much cleaner front of the printer. Now, another really interesting spec of this printer that I know threw me off the most was that the bed is not heated. Most printers nowadays have a heated bed. This allows the prints to stick on there, and then after the heated bed cools down, the prints will just pop right off. This one is a flexible bed, so you can get it off, and you gotta do some flexing to get the print off, but that does limit you. You can only print PLA. More advanced materials like PETG will definitely need a heated bed to allow them to stick well. So that's another reason why you're locked into PLA here. I did test out replacing the build plate surface. It ships with one sticker already applied. It's basically a big square of just paper masking tape. But then I tried blue painter's tape to see if that would work, and it does stick great. Because that paper tape build surface that it comes with is gonna wear out, that's why they give you two more in the bag. But even once you wear out those, I would want this printer to keep going. So that's why I had to test out blue painter's tape and it worked fine. Also what comes in the bag, you come with replacement end stops. So there's all these little switches that test out when it's at the end of its X, Y, or Z movements. And so it gives you spare ones if these switches ever do wear out. I've never had an end stop switch wear out. 
they last a good long time. They also send a couple tools. These are your Allen keys, a little Phillips head screwdriver that should be everything you need to change or tighten things on the printer if things start to get loose. It also comes with a spare nozzle and a crescent wrench to allow you to change the nozzle once this brass one wears out. And if you're not using an abrasive PLA, this brass nozzle should last you six months to a year of solid printing before you ever have to mess with the nozzle. Also in the bag, it comes with some glue stick. This can help your prints stick to the build plate. I didn't really use it here. They also come with a little USB to micro SD adapter in case your laptop or computer doesn't have an SD card reader. You can still plug this in and you just use USB. Another spec I feel like they don't really cover all that much is how safe this is. It's got an external power supply, so it's got this brick similar to like a laptop, and then you just plug it in on the side. I mean, this might just be a laptop adapter that they've made work for this printer. So all of the power switching happens safely and externally in this adapter. There's no big dangerous capacitors in here where you could shock yourself, but an entire 12 volt system will be a lot safer than having a regular 3D printer. You've got 120 volts down in there somewhere, and if you were to touch that incorrectly, you could hurt yourself. This one takes all the dangerous stuff and puts it inside this plastic box, which is a very safe way of doing things. It's also all enclosed in this plastic box that doesn't heat up at all. You can touch anywhere at any time during printing. This upgraded one has this mesh here that covers the nozzle. So even when the printer's at temperature, I touched it and this mesh stays cold the entire time. So if you're in a situation where there might be little kids around who might be trying to reach in there, especially in a classroom, library, demonstration type setting, where people who aren't around printers a lot might be around the printer, it will be a lot harder for them to hurt themselves. Another really nice feature to this printer is how fully set up it is and how quickly you can get it running. I filmed the unboxing, but there's really not much of note. I might put some little clips in here if there's anything of note. Basically from it being in box to it starting the first print took about 10 minutes. So if you don't have experience with 3D printers, it might take you 15 to 20 minutes. It's really that basic. You get it out of the box, you plug in the power supply, you remove all the packaging. There is some cardboard in here that holds the nozzle in place. You simply pull that out. The auto startup guide really steps you through the whole process and the mesh bed leveling that comes with there means you don't have to be tweaking all the bed leveling screws to get things working correctly. It just works right out of the box, took no tweaking on my side. So now I think we can get into some of these test prints to really show off where it works, where it doesn't work. The first one I did, these a lot of these come preloaded in Cura and this is a bed level test it prints all these little squares to see if the entirety of your bed is nice and level. And it passed all of these printed correctly, which is great to know that you can use the entire build volume to print on. Um, other ones of note, this is a little heart with three gears in it. And it's sort of a tolerance test of if these gears didn't spin correctly, that means your the printing axes are not correctly calibrated, but these spin perfectly well. I think it's a weird model. I wish there was a little handle to be able to spin it easier, but it helps if you get something else in there to help you spin these gears around. But that's a pass on the tolerance test. The next test is kind of a limitation. It's a bridging test. This creates all of these different length spans between this inner circle and the outer circle. And so you can see how well it's bridging between the parts. And it does great at the lowest at 10 millimeters. It does fine, but then it starts to fall apart. At 14 millimeters, you're already getting drooping, but the drooping stays consistent all the way from 14 millimeters all the way up to about 46 millimeters, I think it says. Yeah, at 46 millimeters, you're still getting minor drooping. It never fully falls apart. And I think that's kind of the biggest limitation of this is that there's no dedicated part cooling fan. It uses the hot end cooling fan and kind of directs that air down onto the part to try to cool that plastic as it's being laid down. One way to get around bad part cooling is with supports. This is a support test and it passed really well. These look really good and the supports came off very easily. That basically allows you to build plastic which holds up your part in certain areas. Some other parts of note, this is kind of another tolerance test. It's a little butterfly with all these flexible hinges holding all the parts of the wing together. Part of the wing did break off for me, but that's just because I was a little rough when trying to pull it off of the build plate. So I think if I was being more careful, it would have worked. And since this half of it worked so well, I could have reprinted this. I just didn't really feel like it. That's a huge pass. This is kind of a difficult print to get working right. Another print I did, this is a vase mode print. It uses a single line around the outside spiraling up to create this object. 
And these are just great, super quick prints as well. This entire thing took maybe 20 minutes to print. And there's some really impressive vase mode files out on the internet if you do some looking. The next test I did was a filament swap. So halfway through this print, this one was preloaded on the SD card. It's a ring with little cat ears. And so halfway through the print, it had been printing red. I click the pause button, it moves the nozzle away, and then you can remove the red filament, put in green filament, and it continued on the rest of the way. You can make some really impressive things by swapping filament at certain layers. The last test print I had to cover were these benchies, and they're passable. I think the part cooling fan is a big limitation here on the hull of the boat, and also these overhangs. They didn't print very well because the part cooling fan just isn't great on this printer. And this is with the normal profile inside of Cura, so I'm sure if you did some more tweaking, you might be able to get more out of it. But overall, kind of a passable benchy. The overhangs are kind of a limitation there, but for an uncalibrated printer, it's really not the worst benchy I've ever seen. Now there are definitely some downsides to this printer in the specs. That might have already turned some people off of this video, but if you're still here, there are a few other limitations. The big one is the spool holder on the side. The stock one can only hold half kilogram spools. Most printer is printed in a full kilogram, but luckily I found this model online that can be printed on this printer. And so you print it and just replace that spool holder with this one. And then you can use any full kilogram spool you want right on the side. I'm really not sure why they would put half kilogram spool holder on here when most filament comes in full kilogram sizes. Another downside is the lack of upgradability. The feature of having this nice plastic enclosure around it means it's harder to get in there and really change things. But luckily it is printing pretty well on the stock hardware that they send you. So that's more just the flip side of having that feature. Another downside is that it's not the most quiet printer and having it running I wouldn't have it running in my bedroom. I wouldn't even have it in my living room. If I was using this for home use, I would really want a closet I could put it in, garage, spare bedroom, somewhere away from people that could do its printing. So this is some of the volume. The microphone is pointing kind of in between both of us. So you always get this real mechanical movement type sounds that it's making. Also with some of the stock photos of this being used in classrooms, with how loud it is, I know if I was a student, I would be staring at the 3D printer the entire class and would not be listening to what the teacher is saying. So if this was for a school or library setting, I think having a closet to put it in or an art room, some sort of specialty place for it, I would say it's not something you can have running all day in a classroom setting. It'll be a huge distraction. So overall, I'm pretty impressed with this 3D printer. I know I came into it with pretty low expectations after reading the spec sheet, but it has really blown me away in how well and consistently it just does printing. It does have its limitations of the build volume and you can only use PLA, but I haven't had a failed print yet. Well, I did have a single print fail this entire week and that's because I was using my own configuration and tried to do a filament swap halfway through. They always recommend using a raft, which helps it stick to the build plate, but I was not using a raft. And so when I tried to change the filament, I don't think I did it correctly because it just knocked the print over. But I did get successful filament swaps when using a raft. So I think this is a printer where if you just want a printer that works, it does work. There's a lot of great applications for this for a classroom or library setting, or another one I ran into this week of having a backup printer. So earlier this week, I was trying to do an upgrade on my Anycubic Mega S, and I burned out a 12 volt to 24 volt converter on the bottom. And so since I couldn't use that printer until Amazon delivered the part, I had to use my backup printer, which is the Voron V0, which is another small form factor printer. And I really love having that combo of a large printer and a small printer. So this one could be a pretty good consistent small backup printer for a lot of people. For people who use 3D printing in their workflow, it is their job to keep prints coming. And for me, I didn't have to stop all of my projects just because my main printer was out of service for a couple days. So if you're looking for a small form factor printer that just prints PLA pretty well, this might be a good one to look into. It's not gonna be the best printer out there, but for the price and for the size, it really is a pretty good printer. I also think this is a great printer if you want 3D printing things to be your hobby, not working on your printer to be your hobby. So much of my videos on this channel are upgrading my 3D printer, whether it's tweaking configuration or all the other parts of it. But for a lot of people, you really just want to print objects and get objects off the printer and not be constantly fiddling with the 3D printer. Since there aren't upgrades to be done to it, you just get it out of the box and use it. So I could see that being a benefit for the right person. But that just about wraps up this review. If you have any more questions, put them in the comments down below. Also, if you have this printer and there's anything I missed, or if you have had a different experience than I have, 
please let us know in the comments down below. I'd love to hear from you. And while you're down there, and if you've stuck this far through the video, hitting that like and subscribe button down there really helps me out. But anyway, go out there, create something amazing today, and I'll see you in the next one.